you all so much for being here. Uh, my name is Grace. You probably saw a few emails from me. Um, so we're really happy to have this event here today um, in this beautiful space that I hadn't seen before. I'm not sure how many of you have been here, but it's beautiful back here. So um, we're welcoming Nancy Schultz today. She joined the faculty of Salem State University in 1983 and became Professor Emeritus in June 2020. Her scholarship interrogates the intersection of literature, history, and religion, and her expertise is in the history of Catholicism in the US, American Studies, and Harriet Beecher Stowe. She also has done extensive work on the history of Salem, Massachusetts. In 1997, she co-curated an exhibit at the Somerville Museum called Lifting the Veil, Remembering the Burning of the Ursuline Convent. Among numerous other books, she is the author of the award-winning Fire and Roses, The Burning of the Charlestown Convent, 1834. So, on this 190th anniversary of the event, I'm going to hand the mic over and let her teach us a bit more about this piece of local history. So, here's Nancy. Thank you. Well, um, thanks so much for coming. You know, I, I wrote this book quite some time ago, and this is my first event ever at a brewery. So, um, very different setting. <laughs> okay, um, so thank you so much for coming, and um, we'll, we'll get started, and then we'll have some time to have some discussion, hopefully afterwards. I certainly want to begin by acknowledging the important role of the Somerville Museum in the genesis of this book. I want to especially thank Grace Bryan and Evelyn Battinelli for their support over the years. So the book really got kick-started by this exhibition um, at the Somerville Museum called Lifting the Veil. And I co-curated this with an artist named Nancy Natale. I don't think she's here. I think she moved to Northampton, unfortunately. But anyway, we were very thrilled that this exhibition, which kind of put contemporary art in dialogue with the history of the burning of the Ursuline Comet, um, it was named one of the 10 best exhibitions in New England in 1997 by the Boston Globe. And that was competing with all the local um, museums. So we were very happy about that. And it garnered national attention um, and, you know, several articles in the Chronicle of Higher Ed and, and National Press really helped draw attention to the story and led to um, my getting a book contract, for which I was very grateful. I assume many of you are familiar with Somerville and know where this library is. I think it's 115 Broadway, the East Branch of the Somerville Public Library. There is a marker for the Ursuline Convent in front of this uh, library branch. But actually, when we were researching the exhibition and the book, what we learned is the original marker had been a few doors back down a side street. And when they did some renovation to the library, um, this library was built around 19... 18 or 1919, um, they moved the marker forward. And the woman that we talked to had said, I was so glad when they moved that marker. I had been wanting to get my, hot, my driveway hot top for decades. <laughs> so she could finally get her driveway done and the marker is moved forward, which I guess presents us with a a warning about the validity of historical markers actually marking a location. I'm not sure you can always trust them, um, but it does show the approximate location. Um, so I just want to talk a, a little bit at the beginning um, about the vastly altered topography of the site. Uh, this area now is very flat and it has um, the streets are named after states, but in old real estate ads, you can still find references to the nunnery section. It used to be called the nunnery section for many years. 
So since we're coming upon the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution in 2026, but a lot of the New England events are happening this year and in, in 2025, I wanted to draw your attention to the original site of Plowed Hill, which was the original site of the, the Ursuline Convent. Right here I have it marked in red. So in the early and mid 1600s, much of Somerville was an open pasture where Charlestown settlers brought their cattle to graze and it was known as stinted pasture, cow commons, there were a number of different names. So the dairy farmers would travel over Spring Hill along the Milk Row, as it was called, back, back and forth from Charlestown and Boston. That road today is Somerville Avenue. That was called Milk Row. Of Somerville's seven hills, only there are two, Cobble and Plowed Hill, that have now been carved away. Plowed Hill is the place that has been the site of a lot of important events in American history. This is an image of the Ursuline Convent um, with the Middlesex Canal behind it. And so the, the convent building was built on top of Plowed Hill. It was known as Plowed Hill because the fields surrounding the hill were plowed in large circles around the summit. <clears throat> and I just want to talk about um, this Plowed Hill as an important revolutionary war site. Um, 249 years ago this month, August 26, 28, 1775, um, General George Washington sent Brigadier General John Sullivan with a unit of 1,200 men accompanied by 2,400 guards uh, to fortify Plowed Hill. And they wanted Plowed Hill because it commanded such a great um, view of the Mystic River and a clear shot at the British forces on Bunker Hill. So on August 27th at daylight, two warships and cannon on Bunker Hill began day-long shelling of the Americans. Sullivan had only one cannon, but he managed to sink one of the floating warships and incapacitated the other one. There was no other fighting, but the conclusion was an American victory in this battle of the American Revolution on Plowed Hill. Just to finish up the Revolutionary War as part, it was bombed and fortified in 1776. The site of the Ursuline Convent was built in 1826, founded in Boston in 1820, and then the hill well, as we know, 190 years ago today, it was burned to the ground, 1834. Then it was, the hill was removed, um, dug down between 1875 and 1897, and it filled in the canal. So I just wanted, this was a really interesting map. Um, this red bricked part shows the original Middlesex Canal and where it was filled in. And this is where the convent was located. And so, you know, the picture that I showed previous, you could see it was kind of overlooking the Middlesex Canal. Um, and so this, there was a monument erected in 1915 by the Knights of Columbus. That is the monument, and here's another map that shows the location of Mount Benedict, and the convent ruins are on that map. So the new East Branch of the Somerville Public Library opened March 30th, 1918, and it was named the Gold Star Memorial. So, and as I mentioned, at some point during, in the last 50 years, that monument was moved forward to adorn Broadway, where more people can see it. Here is the picture of Mount Benedict Academy. The school was opened in Boston in 1820, and the Ursulines purchased the property, 26 acres, and moved there in 1826. Now, 
their original mission in Boston had been to work with sort of poor incoming Irish and other people just arriving, other arriving Catholics. But the mother superior, um, Marianne Moffat, known in religion as uh, Mother St. George, came down from the Quebec Ursuline Monastery and she really changed the mission of the school. She had in mind more like the Ursulines in Quebec, um, an elite boarding school for girls from age you know, 9 to 16, where they would get a fantastic education. And the school began to really cater to the daughters of Boston's elite. A lot of Harvard-educated Unitarians were sending their daughters to this school. Um, so the students were, were quite elite and the, the tuition was expensive and you know this is closer to the origins. If you go to Quebec City, um, you know they say in Quebec that if you want to, if you're a Quebecois mother and you want to brag about your children, you'd say my son the doctor, my daughter the Ursuline. It was a very elite uh, position for a woman to go into and Marianne Moffat, sister Edmund St. George, really changed the mission of the school to you know this more elite um, idea of education. So surrounding this school and the hill were the brickyards of, um, of Charlestown. There were many, many brickyards and there were lots of working men who had come down from New Hampshire after several generations their farms had failed. And so brickyards kind of surrounded this mount. And the Ursulines had made it into this amazing garden with terraced gardens, it was very beautiful. But I like to think about it as having been surrounded by a ring of fire where all the brickyards of Somerville were located. And the men who were living, who were working in the brickyard also were boarding in these kind of dormitories. They had left their wives and children behind. So the irony is they were living themselves a kind of monastic existence. And that situation always has seemed to me like the spark of these fantasies that the men started to have. There were all these unavailable single women up on this fertile mount and they all they could do is think about them and it sort of led to these fantasies that there were women being held cop captive up there on the hill and the men would look up and they'd make a dollar a day and the school was costing, you know, 5000 a year to send your daughter. And they just, it sort of sparked this weird fantasy that they, they had. Um, so there were many, um, next slide, I'll just get Lyman Beecher, okay. So Lyman Beecher was a well-known um, congregationalist preacher um, who delivered three anti-Catholic sermons in Boston on the day before the fire. Um, there are a lot of reasons why the Beechers were concerned about Catholicism, um, unlike the Unitarians who seem to have really embraced the European style education the Ursulines were giving their daughters. But the Beechers, you know, if you know a bit about them. Their daughter Catherine was in the education business. They had moved west. They were afraid that Catholicism was spreading to the west. And, you know, Protestant schools had a major disadvantage in competing with Catholic schools. And that disadvantage is once the teacher in the Protestant school got married, she had to quit her job. She was not allowed to be married. The celibate Ursuline nuns had a permanent workforce that could, you know, never have to worry about losing their teachers, and they were very experienced teachers because they could teach for years. So um, I also have this ring, which is actually from the exhibition, 
And it's like different ways to connect to history. I thought I'd do the Vanna White thing with the, the Wheel of Fortune today, but um, we have, you know, religious strife, economic changes, you know, we're transitioning from federalist um, elites to a more sort of Jacksonian democracy. Um, education was controversial. Women were not really being allowed in, you know, they could have some education in the public schools, but it was very early for women to get, especially an elite education. Um, you know, there were questions about national identity. What is an American? You know, the Irish were coming in, not very welcome in Boston. Um, there's a shift in government from the aristocratic federalist to a kind of more Jacksonian democracy. During the period of Andrew Jackson's presidency, there were many mob events, you know, a lot of riots. Um, literature, um, there was, a, a few of these came out afterwards, but one of the popular books of the 19th century were these convent captivity narratives. They were like the supermarket literature of the day and people were gobbling them up. The most famous that really became a bestseller in the 19th century was Mariah Monk's Awful Disclosures of the Hotel Dieu Nunnery. It was a story of, you know, it was kind of a pornographic book. And since this is the period of what they would call reform literature, like a lot of temperance novels being published or these convent captivity narratives, you were allowed in a very staid and strict society to read pretty titillating tales of like hidden tunnels under the ground and priests chasing after nuns and men beating their wives. And it provided this form of titillation to readers who were mostly reading religious books in the Bible. So all of that was a factor. Class struggles, we started to see a bigger divide of especially the new immigrants were very um, not very well off. And new roles for gender. You know, what is the role of the woman? Um, the definition in the 19th century of a woman's role was true womanhood. You had to be a wife, a mother, a daughter, or a sister. That was about it. And, you know, the Ursuline nuns, I mean, I have argued in the book that really, if you were a woman in 1834 and wanted to have a career, the best place to have one would be to enter a convent because you could administer a school, you could be professional, you could have a teacher. There weren't that many other options open for women. All of these things set up for this inflammatory event that happened 190 years ago today. So since we're in a tavern, I did not want to neglect the role of alcohol in this event. So. On the night of the riot, a bunch of these Protestant guys went out and got drunk and decided, you know, let's set fire to the convent. Reminiscent of the Boston Tea Party, these men also dressed in Native American costume. I think, you know, a lot of people have discussed why did people dress up in these costumes at the Boston Tea Party. I mean, in some ways, of course, they wanted to disguise themselves. But I've read a lot of other articles that kind of see it in actually a more positive light, like you are getting back to the essential roots of America, the Native Americans, the indigenous po uh, population. That's what a true American is. And so they're, you know, it's just something to think about, about why they um, dressed up this way. On the night of August 11th, after drinking a lot, they gathered in front of the gates of the convent, asked to see a nun who had run away a couple weeks before. Her name was Elizabeth Harrison. She was an overworked music teacher who had a breakdown and ran away to Cambridge and then was brought back to the convent, supposedly, you know, according to her, willingly, but according to the men in the brickyards, unwillingly. They wanted to see her. The mother superior, first of all, these were cloisters nuns. 
she's Mother St. George is not going to produce one of her nuns to satisfy a crowd. And she said, if you don't leave this property immediately, the bishop has at his command an armed guard of 20,000 Irishmen who will burn the roofs of your houses over your heads. So that's a way to kind of diffuse the situation. Um, you know, so obviously that whipped up the crowd and they broke through the doors and they started setting fire to curtains. They threw pian grand pianos out the window, all these musical instruments and just torched everything. So this is a famous uh, woodcut of the 19th century volunteer firemen who pulled up in front of the convent and just decided that they were in cahoots with the crowd and didn't spray any water to help put the fire out. So there were 2,000 people who watched this event, according to some reports. They just watched the building burn to the ground. The next night, they came back and they desecrated the beautiful gardens and also broke into the convent mausoleum and pulled the bodies of deceased sisters from the order out and, you know, it's said that one of the rioters coolly put some of a nun's teeth into his pocket. It did not end well for many of the rioters who participated in this. This is kind of a sideline and some of it is maybe apocryphal, but we know that um, a man named Henry Creasy, who had stolen the, a blessed uh, cyborium from the altar, a couple days later, he was in Newburyport in a place called the Bite Tavern, another reference to a tavern, and he took out a knife and slit his own throat right there at the bar. Um, so that was pretty dramatic. And I've, I've read that seven of the other uh, dry, rioters drowned within a couple years. A couple other ones were hanged because they were um, you know, convicted of other crimes. So it did not end well for some of these rioters. I just want to wrap up by talking about the Mother Superior herself. She was a very powerful woman and a very smart executor, um, executive running the convent. The night of the event, they had to evacuate the girls out the back, and some of the girls actually were hiding in the mausoleum before they ran down the street to a neighbor's house. She was staying in the house, and she went to her office. There was a certain amount of cash in her desk, which she retrieved, and the rioters definitely were breaking in looking for her. So she was just a few steps ahead of them and managed to escape. And most people think if, if they had caught her, they would have definitely murdered her because they hated her. Um, so they, they fled to a neighbor's house. A few months later, oh, there she is. This is a cartoon from the, it's kind of an anti-Catholic de depiction, the trial of the convent rioters. Um, but she did appear at the trial, and this book was published afterwards about them. So, But I wouldn't say it's a flattering portrait. This is Brindley Place, which was the home, the former home of Revolutionary War hero General Henry Dearborn, who had uh, died in, in 1829. That house was available. They rented it. And the thing that caused a little bit of friction is Marianne Moffat rented the house, decided to reopen the school without consulting with her bishop, Benedict Fenwick. So that was, he came back from a trip and he was very surprised. She just decided to reopen the school. So this house in Roxbury was also threatened and there were, you know, they had to have guards around it. And she herself supervised an armed guard to protect the home in, in uh, Roxbury. This is Bishop Benedict Fenwick. Um, they had worked really well together in terms of changing the mission of the school and making it into a really elite organization. And they had a great marketing plan. 
the idea was, all right, we're going to have these daughters, upper class women, they're going to marry important men in Boston, and then they're going to influence their husbands to say, oh, you know, I loved the nuns, my teachers were so great, and it was a way to kind of make Catholicism more mainstreamed. That was the plan, and it worked really well until this event. Um, but then Bishop Fenwick decide, became less enchanted with Marianne Moffat, um, especially when she was doing things without his um, you know, approval. So they had a lot of battles over this, what to do next. And he just thought she was the problem and that the, things would be a lot better in Boston if she was sent back to Quebec. So he made a lot of effort to send her back to Quebec. So she returned to her home monastery in, the, in Quebec, the Ursuline Monastery in Quebec. And she really had no, nothing to do there. You know, she had lost all her power. She had lost all her responsibility. They weren't really giving her work to do. So after a while, she asked to be transferred to the New Orleans Ursuline Convent. And there's a lot of, you know, interesting material about her lack of, you know, participation in that. Then she had arranged in May 1836, next, next slide, okay. So Moffat vanishes without a trace in 1836. She had requested to go to New Orleans. There's no record of her ever re arriving there. There's no record of the Ursulines in New Orleans expecting her. So a few years went by. You know, she left to go on this trip, and then nobody ever heard from her again. So I have some quotes from a letter a couple years later. Bishop Fenwick writes to his Quebec um, counterpart, of Madame St. George, I learned nothing since her departure from Quebec. Next slide. Various rumors represent her as being in St. Louis and as having thrown off all restraint, while other accounts state that she is dead. Next. I know not which to credit or whether to credit any. So it's still a mystery what became of her. Um, she basically vanished. Next. Okay. So onto the convent ruins. They stood on Plowed Hill for 50 years. Um, this, this one is early. Uh, this is right afterwards. And then next. Here's in 1854. They were still standing. And it had, of course, become a great spot to go for a picnic. You know, they, hey, we're just like Europe. We have ruins, too. You know, people would go and enjoy their time there. Next slide. This one is actually from a Harvard yearbook. Like, when you were a student at Harvard, you could order pictures, uh, professionally produced photos of the places you visited while you were in um, Cambridge. And so this was a popular spot for Harvard students to go for walks or for picnics as well. Um, 1865, next. Okay, so the Cathedral of the Holy Cross was built in Boston around, I think it was 1875. Um, and they, um, the bricks from the, from the Ursuline Convent in Charlestown were used to build the vestibule of this church. So some of those bricks are still there today. You can go to Boston and um, see them. It didn't, they didn't use all the bricks, so there still were, were ruins that remained. Um, I think that's the last, that might be my last slide. Um, oh no, so again, just Today, you can see these um, signs, these markers at the East Branch of the Somerville Public Library. You know, as I said, the, the land was plowed down. So, you know, since there's so many of you here, I wanted to ask, you know, I think we could think collectively, what is the meaning of this event at its 190th birthday? 
I mean, religious tolerance is still a widely cited value in the United States. But as in 1834, sometimes the fabric of this conviction frays at the edges. Thank you. Um, happy to take questions, and um, we are selling copies of the book um, for less than a beer here, probably five dollars. You can have your own copy of the book, and I'm happy to sign it. But are there questions? Yes. What was the general reaction of the public around afterwards? Was it like, oh, they had it coming to them, or were people upset because of that? The upper classes protested in the newspaper what a terrible thing it was. And it was really an example of utter lawlessness. And I think, you know, it really tied into the question of property. Anybody who had property, especially elite people, might draw the conclusion, well, if this could be done to this beautiful estate on the hill, can it be done to my property? And so there were a lot of concerns about the sanctity of private property and how this was a violation. It was really the, the sort of working class people who are so incensed about um, this convent for whatever reason. And I really think it has to do with this idea that these women were untouchable and being educated and it, it just inflamed these passions. So Bishop Fenwick got a lot of credit. Um, there were lots of Irish railroad men apparently headed to Boston to take revenge. And he really took the high road. He said, no, we'll let the legal system handle this. Um, you know, we put our trust in the authorities. We're going to be better than they are. But, you know, the trial went on for months. It was a sham. Nobody got convicted. There was one boy who was burning some books at the bishop's lodge. He got sentenced to life at hard labor, um, but he was a 17-year-old boy. And Marianne Moffat, the mother superior, wrote a letter asking for him to be pardoned. The main ringleaders all got off. Then it went before the legislature multiple times for compensation. They never received dissent. I came in late, so I apologize if you've already went over this. But I talked to a friend of mine. She said, oh, yeah, everybody talks about it like it was just last week. So at some point, we went from having the local claimant workers, people lived around the place, gung-ho about burning down a convent, to people feeling like it was a personal affront that the convent was burned down as some of those become more Catholic. Talk a little bit about the sort of transformation in people's Well, I think it was general Irish immigrants who really took this as part of their family story and felt like it was part of their personal family history. It would be talked about at the dinner table, like, oh, those Protestants burned the convent. Um, so it created a real wound, and, you know, there were a lot of tensions between the Irish and the Yankee populations. Um, the first Catholic bishop of Boston was Bishop Cheveris, who was this elite, well-educated French man. He had, actually, when he left Boston, he gave all his books to the library that became the Boston Athenaeum. So he got along famously. You know, he was French. He was polished. The Irish were coming in. They wanted to open a Catholic cemetery in Charlestown. They were dying of cholera and tuberculosis and other infected diseases. Then they would parade through the streets of Charlestown with the corpse, keening loudly and crying. And so the Yankee people, who were not used to these sorts of display, it was just a very different culture. And for the Irish, it became a highly personal, almost a family story. Um, I think he kind of 
mouthed words to that effect, but he and his, you know, he wrote a book, uh, A Plea for the West, I think it was a few years after, warning about the Catholics taking over the West. And in 1855, his son, Edward Breacher, uh, published another really notorious anti-Catholic book. So the Beechers themselves, you know, they really saw the Catholics as competition and their power having descended from Calvinism, their power was eroding and a lot of other religions were starting and they just felt like the Protestant religion was splintered and it was hard to compete with Catholicism. Yes, sir. What, if anything, happened to like, kind of the school movement, or, like, the Catholic school movement post-burning where like, you're saying how the head went and um, the, the head done was Okay. Well, they were just renting Brindley Place, and actually Brindley Place, you know, is a Revolutionary War general's home. It burned to the ground, not because they were in it, but it did burn. It was a wooden house. And then they, I was, there's a really interesting Palladian-type building that was put in its place on the site in Roxbury. I don't know if that house is still standing. But as for Catholic schools, Catholic schools really thrived through the late 19th and I would say into at least the mid 20th century. They thrived because they adapted counter to the American idea of the melting pot. They actually organized schools around ethnic groups. And so in any town you'd have the French Catholic school and church, the Polish, the Irish, and so they survived for many years by actually keeping Catholic ethnicities separate. And it was, it's only been, you know, in the late 20th century and now 21st century, Catholic schools are really struggling um, to stay open. But Bishop Fenwick himself, um, he decided, okay, that's, um, I've had enough with women's education. He went on to found the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester and decided to stick with men's education after this. Yes. Uh, I have two questions. First of all, what do you think of to this subject? You're very knowledgeable and passionate about it. But secondly, did uh, the Ursulines uh, do anything that sort of did alienate them from the community after the Um. Okay, so I'll take the second question first. Um, I mean, Mother, Mother St. George was very proud and very imperious, and she didn't have a lot of patience for people who were not her class. She was very comfortable hobnobbing with doctors and lawyers and military officers, but she thought that the other people who were around her were just crude. So she didn't really have much patience and that didn't endear her to her neighbors. Um, I actually started working on this book because I am um, working on Harriet Beecher, so I've been working on Harriet Beecher Stowe for many years and um, I had published a book, uh, uh, an article on a little known novel of hers, The Minister's Wooing, where I became really interested in the kind of tensions around Catholicism in that novel. And so I started looking into it, and then I was living in Somerville, and I found that the local history room of the Somerville Public Library had all these documents about this event. And I just became, and of course then I came across Lyman Beecher, and I just became obsessed. So. I worked on it for many, many years, and I'm still working on Stowe today. I'm actually, um, Oxford University Press is bringing out um, 33 volumes of her collected works, and I'm the editor of the poetry volume, so one of the 33. So I still do work on Stowe, and I was a founder of the Stowe Society, um, but I took a kind of side turn through <laughs> into this, um, because it was such a fascinating story and I, I just developed a passion and obsession and um, so wanted to do the book. Was Mary Ann Moffat 
Um, that's okay. I didn't go a lot into her biography, but she has a very interesting biography. Her father um, was in Albany, New York, and he was a loyalist, and he ended up fleeing to Nova Scotia. And they were living in Nova Scotia in not very good circumstances. I mean, the plight of loyalists everywhere was pretty grim. But <clears throat> she ended up being recommended to go to the school because they saw promise in her. And she was sent to the Ursuline uh, Convent School in Quebec. And somebody else paid for it. And she just found her niche. She decided to, she converted. I have her abjuration papers. She was born a Protestant. And um, she just decided that her life would be to be a religious woman. Although didn't the uh, first lines have a trait material that's kind of years later? Three, what was it, the same Montreal first line we're fighting back down the first line again? It was Quebec. Um, Quebec City. They were their mother house is in Quebec. They had a house in Trois Rivières. They had a house in Maine. And in the 50s, they moved to Dedham, and they opened the Ursuline Academy, which is still in operation today. And it was actually in the attic of that Ursuline Academy that I found the portrait of Benedict Fenwick that you saw on the screen. It was missing for years. And there's also was at the same time a portrait done of Marianne Moffat by this itinerant portrait painter named James Bowman. And Moffat and Fenwick sat for Bowman, 1831. He brought the pictures to Quebec City where he wanted to teach. And um, I started looking for those paintings. The one um, of Fenwick was actually sent to Dedham and the one from Marianne Moffat, surprisingly, gone missing. And the Ursulines, when we put this exhibition together, they said, we don't have any portraits of Benedict Fenwick. And I said, just go look up in the attic. I have documentation that says it's here. And they went up and they said, oh, that? That's been sitting up here. We didn't know who that was. And so actually, I was very pleased. I kind of. Um, I didn't actually make the final thing happen, but um, I had it appraised at, at a Newbury Street gallery. Holy Cross College ended up buying the, the painting of Benedict Fenwick. So it is there now, and they, they restored it, and they did a beautiful job. And he is the founder of their college. But this is a very young portrait. This Benedict Fenwick that I showed is age 42. And he became very heavy later in life, gained a lot of weight. And he's actually buried at Holy Cross um, in Worcester in a double lot. So he was like kind of a big gentleman. Um, so one of them was really ill with tuberculosis. They all had tuberculosis. They, they didn't understand. I mean, many of them had tuberculosis. When they were in Boston, they thought moving to Charlestown would give them fresh air and exercise. But one of the nuns who was quite ill died a few weeks after this event when she had to run through the fields in her nightgown. It was not good for her tuberculosis. Um, so she died, and she's buried um, in South Boston. The others were, were at Brindley Place when they tried to reopen. Eventually, they were all sent back to Quebec. Mother Superior, Mother St. George disappears. Then they come back to um, Boston to reopen. But the sister who was leading that effort, it was a disastrous failure. They, it never got off the ground again. So then they left. And they didn't come back to Boston until the, the 40s and 50s. So um, I didn't know about the history of uh, the Catholic Church embracing the different, you know, ethnicities. And I wanted to say as kind of a commentary that perhaps after the resurrection of this thing, that St. Clement's marriage right here, it just on my line, has 
because now we have a Vietnamese Catholic parish, which is interesting, kind of re re going back to, you know, because the Vietnamese are not, some of them all over the region because it's one Catholic parish. Yes, that's, that is very interesting. And, and I think that's the same, well, maybe it was St. Is there a St. Benedict's here? That one has always been very multicultural too. And we did some filming when the, the book came out there. They had a, they were actually commemorating the event every October with a procession. Um, that was many years ago, I, I'm not sure. But that's also very multicultural. So the Catholic Church is definitely interested in continuing this model it worked well for them for a century of ethnic, you know, have ethnic groups in a single church. Okay. Yes, sir. A little more about the enclosure list. You mentioned that Paris in the beginning of the convent was a little bit strict. I'm sorry, a cloister? Cloister, I'm sorry. Um, it just means that you swear away the world, you're not allowed to, you're basically in four walls. If you have to go out and do errands, that would only be a few women from the community, they would go out fully veiled. And one of the really controversial things that happened during the trial is the judge, Marianne Moffat, appeared to testify in full, you know, convent, gear and the judge said to her you need to remove your veil we can't hear what you're saying and that was so scandalous because she was you know that was against everything in their order so cloister just means you leave the world behind you're living only in the convent oh yes ma'am yeah. oh There were Ursuline convents in, in France. This was actually an order founded in Italy by St. Angela Marici in six, 1369 or something like that. Um, so um, the convent order was founded in Italy, but they did spread to France. And then when France was in the New World, Canada, they opened the Ursuline convents up there. Well, I want to thank you for being such a wonderful, enthusiastic audience. It's really been a pleasure to speak with you, and, and I'm so grateful for your interest. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, thank you all again for coming. Um, we do have some more information about upcoming historic events th through the Somerville Museum at the end of this table here. Um, we have a big event coming up on September 1st, a reenactment at Powder House. Um, so you can read about that over here. We also have a docent program where we have volunteers at Milk Row Cemetery, Prospect Hill, and Powder House. You can come take tours of that. I've, I see quite a few of our docents are actually here today. So um, if you're interested in membership or signing up for our newsletter, you can see Melissa in the back. And again, Nancy has some books available for $5 um, right here, I think, in the middle in the back. So thank you so much again for coming. Thank you. Thank you.